we will record the uh, the meeting and uh, the recorded uh, meeting will be uh, shared in the youtube link of the channel of i i i triple e mtts bc iit bhu i request all of you to subscribe our channel so it has been already been posted in the invitation email which has been sent to you so please subscribe to our channel for tuning to more updates and please also like our facebook page which has been given in a, in the email which has been shared over there so that you can learn about the upcoming events also as well as this current event whatever you are having so it's 10:58 we will just start in a couple of minutes So, Gautam and Shapni, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Shapni, are you ready? Sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. So, just we are having few seconds left. <laughs> yeah. So it's eleven. So let's start. So good morning to all of you, and welcome you all for the <coughs> webinar five organized by. IEEE MTTS student run chapter IIT BHU Varanasi and today it's our pleasure to have Dr. Devdeep Sarkar among us. So before I formally introduce the speaker, I want uh, my co-moderators to say a few words. May I ask Shopnil to say a few words? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Firstly, I would like to congratulate Dr. Devdeep Sarkar, sir, for joining IIC Bangalore. Thank you. This thank webinar you. is... Yeah. So this webinar is 5.0 and I'm happy to share that we will be having series of webinars on every weekend that is mostly on Saturdays. We have also already planned up to webinar 10.0 and that may extend further based on the response that we will get. I also would like to thank you MTTS student branch chapter IIT Varanasi team and Dr. Somok Bhattachari for organizing this webinar series and taking all the approvals from different speakers and I'm also thankful to all the speakers uh, accepting our request. Uh, thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Devdeep Sarkar, sir. And I hope to see your participation throughout this series. Uh, thank you, all the participants. Uh, thank you, the co-moderators, Sogata Chatterjee, and um, the team from uh, uh, TIFR. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Swapnil, for your nice words. May I now request uh, my other co-moderators, Sogata Chatterjee, to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Shomo Bhattacharya. First of all, congratulations to Devdeep, Professor Devdeep Shorkar for his new positions. Already there is a designation, wise, there is a no change, but <laughs> because IIS is better. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I already listened one lecture, which is which we are given in I RCRS 2020. That's an oh. excellent talk. And uh, that's why, yeah, that's an excellent talk. Though I don't work in MIMO, but uh, MIMO, but I must, I, I, a little bit of understand what is MIMO actually. <laughs> So mm -hmm. before that, I don't know anything about MIMO because I don't never have worked in MIMO. But uh, yeah. when Professor Shomo Bhattacharya is proposed, I said, yes, he's the right choice. And he gave an excellent talk because I have listened to it and I really enjoyed that talk. So without wasting any time, Professor Devdeep, please, Shomo, please, you can, Professor Shomo, yeah. you can just start on it. Yeah. 
so thank you very much uh, shogato and shopnil so we will just now i it is my privilege to introduce professor shorkar so again i am telling you that uh, i am very much lucky that uh, professor devdeep he was although i don't call him professor devdeep or dr devdeep i simply call him devdeep because he is like my younger brother and uh, we have carried out our phd from the same institute as well as from the same lab and i know him i think nearly now i think 10 years you can say in 2020 yeah, yeah. 20 years yeah, so yeah. during his masters time i know him quite well so yeah i should uh, formally introduce him so dr devdeep sarkar obtained his uh, be in etc from jadavpur university kolkata in 2011 and his mtech and phd in electrical engineering from iit kanpur in 2013 and 2018 respectively he has worked as visiting researcher and postdoctoral fellow in rmc canada respectively during may 2017 to august 2017 and november 18 to february 2020 respectively after that he has briefly served as assistant professor in department of electrical engineering iit roper from march to july 2020 dr shorkar is currently joining as an assistant professor in department of ece iisc bangalore his current research interests include design of arrays or mimo antennas for 5g and beyond channel modeling for massive mimo systems and wireless body area networks w bands as well as near field theory and fundamental aspects of em energy dr shorkar has authored or co-authored more than 30 peer reviewed journal papers and more than 50 international national or national conference papers so far he serves as regular reviewer in journals such as ieee transaction on antennas propagation ieee antennas and wireless propagation letters ieee antennas and propagation magazine and ieee access He is also serving as associate editor of IEEE Access since December 2019. Dr. Shorkar is the recipient of the prestigious URSI Young Scientist Award twice, respectively in the URSI General Assembly 2020. And just let me uh, interrupt here because I think that if it were the right time, then the conference should be scheduled by this this time. Yeah, we yeah. are yeah. having the webinar. so all the billeted we should have we should uh, convey our congratulations to you and uh, also he was the ursi young scientist award recipient during ursi asia pacific radio science conference apras 2019 he has also received best paper awards and travel grants in several conferences of international repute so again i am telling that i am very much fortunate to share the lab with uh, devdeep i should say over here that uh, that we have in fact i am telling you that uh, while we were at iit kanpur on the regularly we have to have some kind of regular chats and something you know that during the tea time and other time it is my, my privilege to spend some quality time with him and to come to know a number of things from him still i am learning although he is a junior to me by age but i used to learn a lot of things from him so i don't want to spend some more time so it's so hard to you dr sarkar <laughs> okay so uh, shomok da as i fondly call him professor shomok patta jacho thank you for the nice introduction and very good morning to all all of you all the participants so i think before going into the talk i'll just uh, switch off on my uh, like uh, presentation first let me uh, show it So I think it is visible, right? The screen. Uh, the screen is visible, but still. Uh, yeah, PPT yeah, is yeah, opening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you can go to full okay. screen. Yeah, yeah. I am just going into the slideshow yeah. mode. Yeah. So just, just one minute, Devdeep. So yeah. let me just request one, one second to all the audience to kindly 
switch off to to kindly turn off your video as well as mute your microphone whatever you are having the doubt or whatever you want to make any comment please write it over in the chat box we will take it over at the end yeah yeah let me please carry on yeah, yeah. okay so once again thank you for the very nice introduction and i am devdeep uh, i recently uh, joined as a faculty in the department of electrical communication engineering in isc bangalore in fact just this week itself so before i formally start my presentation i would like to congratulate dr somok bhattacharya swapnil chogoto and all the team members of uh, ieee mtts student branch chapter iit bhu for organizing this webinar series and it is uh, like uh, really nice to see that uh, dr somok is uh, keeping up the momentum of rcrs 2020 where he was the general chair and i was lucky enough to serve as the publicity chair it was back in the february and uh, he is continuing to organize uh, these uh, several events and amid these hard times that we are all facing uh, due to this uh, pandemic and uh, so this is the fifth webinar uh, as i understand webinar 5.0 where i am going to talk about uh, this mimo antennas that is the antennas that are uh, utilized for multiple input multiple output wireless communication system so we can easily see uh, that especially in the present covid-19 pandemic times that uh, the importance of high data rate seamless and robust wireless connectivity i mean without this wireless connectivity on the internet all these webinars or online faculty development programs or uh, courses exams and remote internships uh, these would not have been possible right so in this wireless world a big role is played by the mimo antennas mimo antenna systems that uh, we talk about the 4g long term evolution or lte we talk about 5g 6g and beyond that so today's webinar i would uh, take you through the design and analysis of these antennas and show that how of this research corresponding to the antenna fits in to the larger scheme of uh, wireless channel modeling so that's how i have actually organized uh, my presentation over here but before i go into the main agenda i thought that i would uh, share uh, some of my uh, like journey you can say that first as a grad student and later as a postdoc the reason said to for mainly because this is a like a in event organized by the student branch chapter and also another point is the research portion of this webinar that is going to be shaped from uh, this journey so just uh, you can see uh, two pictures of myself one is taken in iit kanpur uh, back in 2011 when i was uh, simply a master student and who just joined the institute and interestingly you can see that at the back you can see the fountains are still working were still working at that time but right now i don't think that is the situation anyway and the right one uh, is uh, taken uh, uh, just after my phd defense and uh, the thesis i carried out under the supervision of uh, professor kumar vaibhav srivastava and uh, interestingly uh, dr somok gotta charge you somok da also uh, was the first phd student of professor vaibhav srivastava anyway and after that basically my association with this royal military college of canada started it was from 2017 and uh, you can see from the map that the royal military college of canada it's basically located in the border you can see the border between the uh, canada and the united states of america and uh, rmc uh, as we call it in a bridge form is a 19th century institute with lots of heritage and there i was fortunate enough to be advised by professor yahya antar uh, who is an ieee life fellow and currently the ieee ap society president lek and also i had a collaborator dr saeed miki who was associated with the uh, university of new haven at that time so uh, in the figure you can see that this is a view from my uh, coffee room in uh, royal military college canada and uh, myself i was walking through the snow because you know the weather in canada is like that uh, most uh, part of the year there is lots of snowfall and winter uh, is dominant over there so but <laughs> i would uh, not like uh, act as a tour guide you can say and i will just uh, simply move into the main business so first i'll give you a brief glimpse of the research problems that i encountered and tried to solve both in iit kanpur and rmc canada 
So during my uh, masters and the initial parts of the PhD, I was mostly building antennas. So it's uh, everything like it started from the single element antennas. Like uh, this is a you can see a ultra wide band kind of antenna with some structures embedded in it to create narrow notch bands. So this was a, like a very hot research problem at that time. And I uh, did that during my masters. And then I went to design uh, some of the, the triple band single element antennas. And then uh, as my advisor uh, said that I should move into the multiple antenna systems domain. So there I uh, presented this slide to uh, give you a main distinction between the two things that there are antenna arrays and then we talk about MIMO. So a lot of times uh, the grad students or uh, my junior colleagues, many of them face a question that what is the basic difference between the two? So I worked on some both, like I designed some of the arrays like or sub arrays you can say. So you can see that they are basically excited from a single port and we have some uh, like power divider kind of network you can embed phase shifters into that also. And you can ob obtain a certain kind of radiation pattern, a certain bandwidth. So basically the excitation is from a single port and we have to use some kind of power divider network. So there is uh, no provision of accessing these individual antenna ports. Like for example, this antenna element, if you see that there are some of these CSR loading elements. So if you forget about that, simply you can assume that these are some kind of printed dipoles. But these ports there are not directly accessible to us. We are basically exciting the antenna from uh, this particular port and uh, dividing the power. So this is a uniform power divider. This is also like same. But when we talk about the MIMO antenna systems, we have all these various ports accessible. We can uh, use sub arrays uh, in these ports, but these individual ports, we have independent control. And same with the, the structures in the right, if you see. And Another important distinction is uh, for the radiation pattern in an array, we generally go into the concept of the array factors. Like we know the element pattern. This is just a simple undergraduate or early graduate uh, antenna theory from Balinese. You can see that uh, if you know the element pattern and if you know the array factor, then you uh, observe the total antenna radiation pattern by using this pattern multiplication concept. But that is not the case in MIMO, like uh, the, the four port structure. I will come into this in later stage of my presentation. Here you cannot uh, say that you know the uh, single antenna pattern and then you just translate into the complete array factor kind of thing. So there you may have to use some concept like the generalized array factor or things like that. So these were the works that I basically did uh, uh, as in terms of the antenna design. And we reported in several journals. I have just mentioned it here. But uh, I was not only interested in like simple uh, design of the component level antennas. I was more interested to see things slightly differently. I wanted to focus on the scope of electromagnetic research in this kind of wireless system. So they are actually a lot of problems actually proliferated out. And uh, one uh, key thing that I moved into was from the antennas, I wanted to see the concept of the channel and MIMO channel modeling. So analytically, we were uh, uh, trying to observe certain properties of this spatial correlation. So by spatial correlation, we mean the interaction between the multiple elements in a MIMO antenna or uh, you, it can be antenna array also. So several cl closely spaced antennas, they have some kind of interaction that could be in the near field, that could be in the far field. So the far field correlation, <coughs> we tried to model it in terms of some uh, new uh, analytical construct that is known as the infinitesimal dipole modeling and cross correlation Green's function. So this is a concept introduced by Said in uh, 2015. So I used that and did some analytical work. And uh, these algorithms we also integrated with the well-known FDTD or finite difference time domain technique. And uh, for, with that, we could find out the wide band data. That is the uh, spatial correlation coefficient, envelope correlation coefficient over wide frequency range. And this we can do in the far field and also the near field. With the FDTD tool, uh, we also did some of the other problems. One is uh, the full wave uh, simulation of the entire MIMO channel. And that we manipulated using some frequency selective surfaces. And this is a very hot topic in the present when people are um, uh, saying about the 6G. And uh, some of my senior colleagues in ISC Bangalore also 
have worked on similar problems. This is uh, basically the intelligent reflecting surface based communication. So that we reported and also not only the application side, we also were interested to see the generalized near field aspect of antennas like energy around antennas, the classical uh, reactive energy concept that we treated with the FDTD tool. Not only that, we introduced a fundamentally new concept of this localized energy in some other webinar or some other uh, place, I might take up that topic, not today. Uh, so that localized energy concept was uh, we introduced and we uh, tried to solve some of the problems using that. But uh, I am just showing the different publications that came out of this. But uh, the idea is we are uh, looking into the quality, not the quantity. So as one of my teachers said, that a publication should be like a bath after a good meal. So it is important that we see the new concepts, not the count of the papers, the concepts that are introduced, that is very much important. So uh, anyway, with this background, I come to the main agenda of today's presentation. I would not go into very like detailed mathematics or anything, just uh, talk to you through the different aspects of this MIMO antenna design. So the first thing is that MIMO antennas are very much important. We say that in 5G or anything, stuff like that. But uh, why? Uh, the question is why these are so important? What was the reason that researchers wanted to come into this domain of MIMO antennas? So for that, we have to really understand what 5G really is. So uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the evolution of the cellular communication system and from a user's point of view, because in the present age, I guess all of us, we have the this uh, cell phone kind of things. So you see the contrast, like in the left, there is a uh, army personnel with a large kind of portable uh, AM, FM radio based uh, receiver, or you can say a transmitter also. So he is trying to communicate with maybe some of his peers using that. It is taken from the 1942. So uh, the time of the world war and stuff like that. So this is a military grade portable AM, FM radio. So this is the first time you can say that people uh, are trying to communicate wirelessly in a like uh, pretty field on on field basis wirelessly to some of their peers and then we have uh, the present day smartphone and lot of features so the contrast in terms of the size of the thing like you can imagine uh, we are not carrying this kind of a large device like this with us we are having a pocket uh, uh, where we can place that smartphone in our pocket itself so the smartphone and it also has several other features other than the voice communication, like we have uh, uh, several other properties, uh, several other uh, like advanced uh, features, internet connectivity, file sending, video downloading, a lot of things are there. So this kind of change or this kind of contrast, it did not happen in a single day. Uh, so uh, mobile communication, the previous thing, the army personnel kind of thing, that was not for the civilian purpose. The, for the civilian purpose, uh, it started gradually in 1946. The Bell system introduced the first commercial mobile telephone service, that is the MTS. So we can call it the 0G, and some people say that. So it is not for the user to user kind of thing. It is mostly for uh, the vehicular technology kind of application, like uh, there are uh, some, say, ambulance or some other freight cars or anything. So there is a, 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 for their connectivity, this kind of telephone system was used. If we look into the kind of smartphones that we are presently using, that portable cellular phone was uh, first around this 1984. And from that, the journey of this 1G kind of thing started. So you can see a picture of a businessman who is using a Motorola kind of portable cellular phone at Meigs Field Airport in Chicago. So uh, then the thing started like from 1980s and we are currently into the 2020 and we are looking far beyond that. So uh, in the first generation, this total access control communication system and advanced mobile telephony system in the uh, US and there was the UK thing. And then it moved into the 2G, like GSM, GPRS and all those things are there. So every uh, kind of generation, there are two stages, this research and, standard, uh, research and standardization stage, you can see that uh, this kind of thing and the commercialization. So if you look into the 2020, we are currently like in the juncture of the like research and uh, standardization and the commercialization are picking up. So hopefully within few years, we'll uh, see the breakthrough of this technology. Now, what is the change that is primarily driving? We could talk, we could talk in using the 
earlier gsm uh, gprs phones also but it was mostly for the mobile telephone the thing that is changing is based on the data part that initially we were content with using simply a uh, text messages but now we can send large video files within small span of time and this kind of uh, thing basically indicates that we are enhancing the data rate now the question is that is 5g only about the enhancement of the data rate there are two things like one is the capacity that basically determines the data rate and then we also have to think about the coverage so once we go high up in the spectrum so you can see that when we work below the first uh, like 1 gigahertz or 1 to 6 gigahertz frequency range we think about both coverage and the capacity but when we go above this 30 gigahertz or the millimeter wave band or 100 gigahertz band then we are mostly concentrated into the small cells and 5g millimeter wave communication is there so uh, these are the two aspects of capacity and coverage but apart from the capacity uh, we also have certain other aspects in 5g which sometimes we uh, tend to forget that uh, this capacity part it is basically related to this enhanced mobile broadband so where we look into this extreme data rate and extreme capacity like capacity people are envisioning around 10 tbps per kilometer square but apart from this enhanced mobile broadband there are these aspects like this mission critical control or people call it ur llc that is ultra reliable low latency communication so we have this uh, latency as low as uh, 1 millisecond and that will also be supporting extreme user mobility so these are the research areas that people are uh, like putting their efforts into and also there is this aspect of massive internet of things so where uh, the this uh, large number of sensor nodes like high high density 1 million nodes per kilometer square or ultra low complexity so these are the vision like the main objectives of 5g enhanced mobile broadband mission critical control and massive internet of things so these are the visions of this 5g new radio another way of looking into is this is taken from some other another white paper that we will talk it the 5g hyper service cube so there you have the links per kilometer square the delay in millisecond and throughput so not only like uh, the 5g will encompass a large variety of these uh, features but also there should be some backward compatibility and you should see that there is this 2g 3g and 4g sitting right over there so there are various things augmented reality hd city and smart sensor lot of things are coming uh, in the purview of the 5g so it is not simply just the increase of the data rate so that was my main point that i tried to make here but now uh, the main thing that why this data rate enhancement is basically uh, related to the or led us to this mimo so two things one is the limitation in the available spectrum because we know from our simple knowledge like undergrad knowledge of this sanon channel capacity for a single input single output system that we are uh, we can increase the capacity by increasing the bandwidth but can we have a uh, infinite amount of spectrum the answer is no there are certain specific uh, frequency bands that are approved for the 5g by the international telecommunication union and people are also looking into like this is uh, some kind of data but these are constantly getting revised and new bands are being introduced like there is this sub 1 gigahertz band also here i have mentioned mostly the sub 6 gigahertz as well as the sub millimeter wave frequency range the 28 gigahertz 38 gigahertz and 77 gigahertz all this stuff are there but the point is that the spectrum is limited so we cannot increase the available bandwidth beyond a certain thing and also there are some protocols so fdm and all those things will come into the picture second thing is the energy efficiency the transmit power level we cannot like in the base station as well as the handheld devices that we have we cannot allow them to increase the high power like uh, to increase our snr we know that if we increase the snr we will get better uh, thing but that is not the objective that can cause some biohazards and all those things so we have to limit all those things and we uh, need to focus towards the greener and safer communication system so uh, for these two like when we have the limitation in the bandwidth when we have limitation in the transmit power level then the only option that engineer said was to go for a multiple uh, input multiple output kind of antenna system that is where the transmitter is enabled with multiple antennas the receiver is also enabled with multiple antennas and there are some kind of signal processing involved so just a generic uh, mimo system model from a electromagnetic viewpoint just what i said in language you can see over here 
that these are the various you can say the uh, like transmit nodes or if you will say from an electromagnetic point of view or circuit point of view you can say that these are various sources and we are basically having a, some kind of network in between and that will be translating into this multiple number of antennas so empty number of antennas in the transmitted similarly in the receive end also we are having the multiple antennas over here and there is a in between impedance transformation network and finally some current is delivered to this load and in between this transmit block and the receive block we are having something known as the channel so this is a general uh, viewpoint of a like you can say a single user kind of mimo system which was initially popular later on we moved into the multi user and passive mimo system but from the understanding point of view i have just chosen this one so we have to see that there are a certain interplay between these antennas itself so that gives us that transmit correlation matrix and similarly this interaction between the receive antenna elements gives us the receive correlation matrix and in between we have a independent identically distributed relay wireless channel now uh, we are I, i was not from the exactly the signal processing background so my main uh, uh, motto was that what are the main design challenges for the integrated 4g lt and 5g mimo antennas so be it in the transmit side be it in the receive side what are the main challenges so first of all the we have to like for any antenna engineer we need to think about the conventional single antenna aspect in terms of the impedance bandwidth gain and side lobe level front to back lobe ratio polarization criteria these things we have to keep in mind definitely but there are some added things like what is the uh, we can do in terms of the overall footprint reduction because our devices or everything will have to be operating in a reduced electrical size in terms of the square of operating wavelength so the challenge is with this compact size we need to achieve this multi band or wide band performance but the second point whenever we are bringing these various antenna elements close together then we will definitely having increase in the mutual coupling and increase in the mutual coupling will degrade the performance will degrade the effective channel capacity so that is also another design problem or challenge that we face that we need to reduce the mutual coupling between these various antenna elements like uh, suppose these two antenna elements are sitting close together we have to reduce the mutual coupling between them so there we use the neutralization lines we have uh, people have using the electromagnetic band gap structure defected ground structure and stuff like that another important point is regarding the channel like we have different specific propagation scenarios in terms of the indoor and outdoor so your antenna although you characterize it in an aqueous chamber but it will not operate in that ideal free space environment so you have to think about the effect of the specific propagation scenarios be it the indoor and outdoor and how we can improve the channel capacity in this different kinds of uh, propagation scenario like we can use the pattern on polarization diversity so i'll just give one example uh, when we move later in uh, in the talk so uh, we talked about the increasing the number of antennas right so there we can think from the point of view of a cell phone like whether our cell phone has this multiple antennas so you can see that this picture i have taken from this early days this 5 uh, g kind of a system this motorola that picture that i showed you so there uh, the idea was the people were mostly using in terms of the antenna people are using this sleep dipole so what is a sleep dipole just to for the students i want to like clarify it a little bit so the idea is we have a coaxial cable you can uh, see from a theoretical point of view coaxial cable is having a inner conductor and there is this shield conductor or the outer line and uh, one thought people can have is okay we can simply extend this uh, inner conductor and just make it a radiating kind of a structure but there is a problem that a dipole and uh, is a balanced and this uh, coaxial thing that will be some uh, kind of unbalanced kind of system so to create that balancing and to uh, get a steady radiation pattern people are having this kind of sleep so sleep is basically you can i uh, think from your shirt uh, like the point of view so there is this sleep and you sometimes fold it up so this is kind of a sleep uh, dipole kind of arrangement that gives us the omnidirectional kind of radiation pattern with uh, stable this in terms of the current and all those things so this there is single one antenna my point is the single antenna in the handset but now if uh, you look into a uh, modern cell phone so this is not modern but uh, uh, probably few years back but the idea is typically the same that we have several antennas over here 
and most importantly i want you to focus on this part that there is this uh, dual band kind of thing there is a high band arm for 1800 megahertz and low band arm for 900 megahertz where we are using this inverted f antenna so this is a transmit receive kind of dual band inverted f antenna so uh, only the, this antenna is having the dual band feature but apart from that we are having this diversity antenna as well that is multiple antennas are present in your receiver so when you have two antennas in your handset there are certain added advantages that you can have so this uh, technique of uh, using like specially uh, separately located antennas it is basically known as the special diversity another way uh, some uh, vendors also do that using the polarization diversity like you can see the two inverted f antennas one is you can say this is the vertical polarization and this is the horizontal polarization so two polarized uh, are there so this is known as the polarization diversity so these are kind of stuff that people are trying to put in more and more antennas and of late there are uh, several this 4g 5g multiple antennas for future multi mode smartphone applications so uh, there is a professor desmond sim so their group is working uh, prolifically on that and many other groups are also following the trend and people are using like several antennas in the like you can see that the space we do not have too much space like we have to adjust it in the edges of our smartphone and we cannot always get very good like s11 minus 10 db performance people sometimes have to be satisfied with much lower than that but the idea is we want to tap into the channel and we want to get the maximum information from uh, this uh, like kind of smartphone kind of thing and we want to uh, like uh, get the enhance the channel capacity now the question that naturally will come into your mind that okay i am putting in more and more antennas but how uh, that means that we will get the enhancement in the capacity so there are lots of mathematics involved in there i am just showing uh, like a glimpse of that so in the talk you can see a comparison between the single input single output that ciso communication system so we have a transmitter we have a single transmit antenna this is the channel response function this is in between and this is the receive antenna coming to the receiver so basically in this kind of scenario we have the c ciso as a function of this like this is taken per bandwidth so bandwidth time is omitted from here so this is basically capacity per bandwidth the unit is bits per second per hertz so here you can see this term sitting over here pt by sigma n square so this is the input snr like from the transmitter end and you have the channel response function h so this is a scalar here right scalar quantity for a single input single output system now when we move into this multiple input multiple output definitely the channel response will not be a scalar it will be a matrix or you can say a vector also so the matrix thing this capital h is basically the matrix and now the capacity for this mimo system is translated into this thing like there is this matrix of uh, like identity matrix with mr uh, dimension mr times mr mr is the number of receive antennas and we have the input like transmit is and divided by this mt that is the number of antennas in the transmitter so there are detailed mathematics involved in why this is like this but the idea is uh, we have this uh, matrix and product with the hermitian of the same matrix so what happens is this mimo capacity becomes a kind of a combination of several parallel ciso channels like in the same uh, snr level we have several parallel eigen channels involved and you can say some kind of parallel processing kind of thing is happening so if your number of receive antennas is increasing transmit antenna uh, whatever be the uh, thing like transmit antenna you can say it has 10 elements for the in the base station now if you increase the number of receive antennas the rank of the matrix will increase and when the rank of the channel matrix get enhanced then we have the enhancement in the data rate so this is the kind of view that this data rate enhancement using the mimo i just try to explain from a simple antenna engineer's point of view without going into the details of the mathematics and another point that i would like to uh, emphasize upon here is that this channel is not independent of the antennas like we have to uh, take into account this receive correlation matrix as well as this transmit correlation matrix the in between term h iid is basically the stochastic term but there is this uh, receive correlation and the transmit correlation which is completely deterministic and it is in hand of the antenna engineer so if you 
some kind of do some kind of problem in those parts then whatever algorithm you may uh, use by using the stochastic channel that might not work in the satisfactory way so uh, we need to think about finding out the correlation between these antennas in a very intelligent way so anyway first i will from the design point of view so i talked about putting in multiple antennas in the system so uh, just i take the example of a four element pattern diversity mimo antenna design and just uh, take you through that what kind of uh, exercise uh, goes to where do we try to de uh, design a, this kind of a multi element mimo antenna so a specific test case which i uh, took during my phd so uh, the generic configuration of a planar four element mimo kind of antenna so right now we are not bothered about whether it is going to be used in the transmit side or the receive side it might also be used in the access point kind of application so we want to find out that how we can design this pattern diversity or the sectorial beam form this is used in various other branches of antenna engineering also but for the compact devices there are certain design criteria that we have to think about one thing is the specs are like the peak gain is of the order of 4 to 5 dbi and uh, the footprint has to be in terms of the square of the wavelength uh, it is have to be reduced in terms of this uh, lambda square where lambda is the operating wavelength in terms of the frequency range now we have to think that we have to cover the sub 6 ghz band and 4g lte which lie typically in these kind of ranges right the 2.5 3.5 5.5 gigahertz frequency range and then we also have to think about the backward compatibility sometimes uh, it could be uh, the specification but two critical things one is the isolation that is the port to port isolation has to be greater than 10 db and the envelope correlation coefficient that has to be less than 0.1 so i'll talk about the ecc calculation in a more a little bit more detail later on for the time being you can just assume that it is a measure of the spatial correlation between the multiple antennas so one option is to choose the miniaturized multi band element and the other option is to induce a lower frequency mode in the complete structure so what i was trying to say here is that uh, we can think that okay i am going to design the antenna element first and uh, make it work in various frequency bands and then put several such antennas together but the problem with this kind of design is when we place various antennas in the close proximity there are some coupled modes and induced modes in the system so uh, that uh, we have to do some kind of in situ design like in the complete system we have to optimize the antenna design parameters such that it uh, gives us the impedance matching response in those specific frequency bands and at the same time on the go we have to tune the gain we have to tune the isolation and take care of the envelope correlation coefficient so this is generally the idea that is followed so for any uh, like uh, student or any uh, young researcher who is starting the first option is to uh, see what is happening with simple dipoles because dipole is the first structure that we are introduced in our textbook so we can think it from the perspective of printed dipole kind of antenna system so you can see that i have uh, shown you an arrangement of this uh, rotationally symmetric arrangement of four of such uh, these printed dipoles on some kind of substrate so right now i am not bothered about the feed that part i will uh, say later for the time being i am exciting these dipoles by using simple lumped port over here right so you can simply take this design parameters and try to reproduce the result itself so what you will find is that the operating frequency or what we call them antenna impedance uh, matching band that is mod of s11 is less than 10 db that is um, less than minus 10 db that is basically happening in that frequency range around 4.7 gigs or something so uh, two things one is the we have to uh, also look into the mutual coupling so there is a internal symmetry here that you can see that s21 and s41 like uh, because of the symmetry this s21 and s41 will basically be the same so we are only bothered about the s21 along with the s31 over here so what we are observing is now when we are taking this 2 and 4 and trying to see the coupling between uh, the one and these two elements that is actually some kind of less as compared to the s31 although it seems that this is located in a slightly greater distance if you just could see the port to port kind of thing but the idea is if these are of the same polarization the elements 1 and 3 so basically that gives us some kind of 
uh, like uh, larger uh, coupling as compared to the other two elements like two and one they are basically orthogonally polarized element pairs now uh, we see that the radiation pattern at 4.7 gigahertz when the excited antenna port is one two three and four so you can see that there is a some kind of coverage of this entire azimuth direction and pattern diversity is there but next uh, we want to uh, take the same uh, like footprint this uh, ls the dimensions of the substrate we keep that same but we want to operate our antenna at some lower frequency than the 4.7 gigahertz and also we want to increase the bandwidth also further so uh, the trial that we did was we can uh, basically enhance you can see that the ground plane of one of the um, uh, like it basically the arm of one of the dipoles is enhanced into the uh, kind of ground plane of a cpw fed or a microstrip fed monopole and the uh, another arm it is basically made in the inverted l kind of shape and so that is effectively bringing down from the 4.7 gigahertz you can see that the impedance matching is brought down here but something happened what happened was that no longer this uh, one and two they enjoy the same kind of orthogonal polarization uh, kind of uh, nature because of this uh, protruded ground plane and this kind of inverted l kind of structure that we are having there will be some kind of coupling current so the s21 level is basically going higher and this s31 level is also kind of like this uh, it is not uh, uh, like uh, changed too much now another way we can uh, decrease that s31 level significantly especially in the higher frequency range is by simply connecting the these extended kind of uh, dipole arms which will later on sh show that how it will act as the uh, partial ground plane of printed monopoles so this kind of connectivity is basically leading to some uh, coupling currents and that is cancelling out the uh, coupling at the higher frequency so you can say that some neutralization line kind of concept is coming in here so by connecting the ground plane. so so far these are some conceptual level i am talking these elements uh, we have to think about how to, we can practically realize so this does the radiation pattern i'll skip that so in terms of the practical realization i thought about the using inverted l antenna so this is basically excited from a particular port you can see that the sma connector model over here and there is this microstrip uh, feeding line and the microstrip line is basically supported by the uh, like bottom partial ground plane over there and there is some uh, this inverted l kind of arrangement so what we started with a single element and then uh, eventually we use this kind of connected ground plane just to show that there are basically two uh, modes like this lower frequency mode is uh, if you see the case 5 that there is a separate mode that is coming from the structure and the normal uh, like isolated antenna radiation uh, or isolated antenna s11 mode is already there this is for the case 1 you can see that this is already there but when we talk about the case 5 then we have an additional mode and we explained in our paper in the awpl 2017 that how this is basically coming by explaining the radiation uh, like radiating current distribution at these different frequencies and then we uh, found out the couplings also by putting the other planes the couplings we wanted to reduce beyond a certain range and uh, basically we wanted to satisfy the minus 10 db criteria so uh, the problem little bit problem was there at the this like uh, lower edge of the band you can say like 2.7 to 4.94 gigahertz it is co already covering lot of this useful frequency band but at the lower edge there is some problem with this uh, particular coupling but uh, at the like other portions that has gone considerably down and then we fabricated the prototype and we showed that uh, the pattern diversity in this system is happening then next we wanted to further reduce the dimension and for that we introduced some kind of uh, SRL loading concept like the split ring resonator if you choose the specific dimensions of the ring and uh, place it in the vicinity of the monopole so for each of these monopole we tuned the arm lens a bit and then placed a SRR of a specific dimension there are certain theories that how we can choose the dimension of it this SRR itself to make it work in certain frequency bands but the idea is the frequency uh, like the lower band is now moved slightly uh, like there is red shift like it uh, moved in the lower frequency regime and now it is covering most of the useful 2.5 3.5 and also the upper WLAN band 5.8 gigahertz frequency band we are trying to 
cover like this was without the SRR loading there are two radiating modes and then when we uh, put the SRR so this particular uh, band was actually split and one of that split thing was merged with this mode so basically we are having a wide bandwidth and another upshift was there for this frequency so this covered the 5.8 gigahertz frequency band and we reported this one in electronic letters at that time so these are the some kind of uh, like design concept that we use based on the requirement of the frequency range and all but the next point is like okay this thing is done but we have not yet taken into account the effect of the realistic propagation scenario so there the concept of spatial correlation we need to understand that there is a metric which is we basically define in terms of the row or uh, that is known as the envelope correlation coefficient that is de dependent on a number of things first thing is the radiated field the theta and phi components of the radiated antenna field so the antenna is not only about the s parameters we have to also think about the radiated field and once we know about that fields we also have to take into account the incoming angular density uh, functions of the plane waves so there we are basically now uh, having this uh, p theta and p phi so these are basically the probability density functions along the theta direction and along the phi direction so it is basically taken as a gaussian uniform kind of propagation environment that is along the theta plane it is basically a gaussian and along the azimuth it is having a uniform kind of distribution and also there is a some kind of uh, you can say uh, so incoming angular spread which is uh, talk in terms of the sigma that is uh, the incoming angular spread or variance you can also say so the main observation is that when we change the various angles of uh, incidence and we check this is a, just simply a snapshot for the angle of incidence 20 degree and also change the incoming angular spread the ecc basically that is uh, having some kind of change like when we reduce the incoming angular spread in certain cases the ecc may go very high so the idea is we needed to keep the ecc less than 0.1 for several range of uh, in uh, like uh, this uh, propagation scenario so from the designer point of view we have to know that when our system will work and when it won't work so this kind of rigorous study is very much essential but sometimes what people do is people simply calculate the envelope correlation coefficient for a specific propagation scenario like a uniform propagation scenario but at least it is better to cover uh, several realistic indoor or outdoor propagation scenario for example this particular propagation scenario is basically some outdoor propagation scenario parameters that i have chosen and then all the antennas are characterized in terms of that so this is uh, like i wanted to share the design flow of this kind of multiport uh, four element antenna system now uh, present day people are also looking into the massive mimo antenna architecture like where we are going to use a large number of antenna in the base station so it is not only four so what kind of thought process goes in that so for that i will first briefly talk about the i the, since i mentioned the base station so evolution of base station antennas for mobile communication you can see this paper by beckman and linmark so typically the base station antennas are uh, of this height one to two meters with gain around 15 to 21 dbi and are placed in the towers between this 25 to 75 meter above the ground they have the high aperture efficiency they can handle power up to 4 500 watt and something like that so the idea is we need to think about the sectorial coverage we need to think about the diversity to combat relay fading now you can say, say that why diversity is needed here because the base station communicates to the user but the user also will communicate to the base station and different users are located in different uh, positions and they might move in different speed so the antennas will have to be equipped with some kind of diversity mechanism so that the fading is basically combated there will be the fading in the channel so the idea of using this multiple antennas in the uh, whether be it in the base station or whether be it in the receiver is basically to combat this fading effect so that is one main challenge that comes there now what is massive mimo if you remember the earlier slide where i are showing that we can have the large power divider and we can uh, split the power from one input port into various uh, uh, amplitude and phase uh, differences and we can excite all the antenna elements but the ultimate case in this kind of large phase array we can have that we can have a dedicated transceiver that can be integrated directly to each antenna element 
this will give us the maximum amplitude or phase control so this looks good in terms of the theory but there are uh, definitely several economic aspects manufacturability heat management weight these also have to be considered so there is a trade off like if we have the maximum access to all the antenna ports and if we have a large number of antenna system then we have lot of flexibility in terms of steering the beams whether we use the analog beam for being whether you use the digital or some kind of hybrid mechanism can be there but uh, the main thing is we can uh, uh, also <laughs> like run into some problems in terms of the realization so there has to be some kind of trade off anyway the idea for this massive mimo this beam forming is you can just see the difference from a 4g sectorial antenna so there we are basically having only you can say the azimuth kind of beam forming right so this is our uh, base station and various antenna uh, base station antenna elements are located and it is covering various sectors like this there are ways to tilt this beam like there is some uh, mechanical tilt there can be to point the beam rightly down to different buildings or different users but at the same time uh, there is no kind of resolution in terms of this direction that is the elevation direction you can say so this is our elevation direction and this is our azimuth direction this is simple like spherical coordinate system kind of uh, thing i am saying now in the massive bimo the kind of flexibility that i was talking about if you zoom into this picture you might see that there are hundreds of antenna elements in these panels and then we can use proper beam forming technique to get the uh, like uh, elevation beam forming as well as the azimuth beam forming so the beams are very much pointed and sharp and they can uh, have these uh, different users map by use of these beams now uh, when uh, we show this type of figure then people sometimes uh, get uh, like uh, afraid they can be that okay i'm using several like this uh, high pointed beams so what is going to have can we direct large amount of power into a user and the user is threatened the idea is absolutely the opposite like if we have the high gain kind of links then there is no need to use uh, large amounts of power so basically we can reduce the power that can be uh, like fed into the base station very effectively if you have this high uh, like pointed links so uh, it will effectively lead to the less spillover in terms of the rf power and we can have effective greener communication now uh, so far these are the conceptual thing so but how we realize that or people used to do that is uh, something like this massive mimo test bed and this is taken from the lund university in sweden so there is a control processing centralized processing and distributed processing units and in the front end we have this array of antennas and there are uh, they have taken the patch antenna array kind of thing but i will uh, focus on some stacked patch geometry so instead of going in too much details i will just uh, but say about the main physical aspects like the idea is we want to re realize this stacked patch antenna with dual polarization and low mutual coupling for the massive mic so the gain has to be high so they are using a sub array kind of configuration instead of a single patch they are using four patches and we have to excite these patches in a certain way that we have a high gain radiation with dual polarization feature so there are two ports in the feeding network there is this one port and this other port so each of the port will basically give you uh, one uh, polarization that is orthogonal to the other that in this figure if you see that the port one it gives the current distribution in such a way that it gives the horizontal polarization and then in the port 2 it will give the vertical polarization so you can go in details in the paper that how exactly this uh, current distributions are coming into the picture then this is a single array unit now when we talk about massive mimo from the single array unit we have to move into in a step by step fashion like we have to design the sub array and then the sub arrays have to be organized in such a way that it covers the all the directions and it is basically giving us the maximum accessibility to all the excited ports so from the single unit sub array we go into the four unit sub array this impedance matching and all these things we can you can see that they are basically uh, using the geometry in such a way or the dimension parameters in such a way that it operates in the sub 6 gigahertz 3.7 or 3.8 gigs frequency range and we also see that the mutual coupling between these various ports all the port combination so there are eight ports over here so all the relevant mutual coupling parameters have to be well below the 30 db uh, range or minus 30 db uh, mutual coupling range then 
we use finally the turning torso architecture like now you can see that here this is a single uh, like array unit now we have used four of these uh, two element array, uh, like two port array units to get a sub array and these sub arrays are basically organized in this kind of a turning torso current of arrangement so there are three stages these are called the stage stage a stage b and stage c and they are you can see that they are not just simply placed one above the another like so there uh, some kind of angular rotation is there 20 degree or something from one stage to the other to uh, reduce the mutual coupling and now all the mutual coupling parameters will come but they have ensured that this falls well below the 35 degree so now when we are enabled with such an antenna system then we are basically getting a very like uh, flexible and it will cover all the circumferential azimuth direction as well as since have we we have this number of elements in the vertical direction as well so we can have this elevation beam forming also so these are the challenges that massive mimo base station architecture design uh, like has and uh, from the indian context we are currently also looking into building up this kind of antenna systems and the 5g lab there is in isc bangalore and they are also looking into the millimeter wave realization of this kind of system so finally in the fag end of the talk i will just talk about this uh, channel modeling aspect like so far i have talked about the antenna design and the various challenges that come in terms of the mutual coupling and the diversity and all those things but uh, the antenna is not a standalone or a separate component we have to think the interaction of it with the channel and how uh, that actually plays the role in terms of the massive mimo antenna design and what are the research challenges so uh, this is the uplink and downlink operation of the massive mimo system so the downlink is basically when the base station is communicating with the users and the uplink is basically when the user equipment is sending some kind of signal to the base station so this is important because from that pilot the, the basically the base station will determine the where the user is and then it will sync the beam in that way so this is how generally it works but there are certain aspects in this antenna uh, like channel modeling that people sometimes uh, neglect one is uh, often people are assume that the antenna elements are simple isotropic thing and this comes from the essence of the antenna array factor view point like when we talk about the array factor then we can assume that the elements are simple isotropic and we can multiply the complete thing your screen has been uh, some some that it has been uh, is not it is not shared so can you please do that uh you cannot see the screen no it has been just of sharing okay okay let me just see but because in my end it is basically shared it is yeah, showing stop, you please stop sharing and just reshare okay 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 just wait a second yeah sure yeah uh present screen start presenting i think there is some kind of yeah actually, actually one person one audience had suddenly shared his screen oh okay okay so okay right yeah yes i'm sorry please go ahead <laughs> okay 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 it's okay it's okay sorry for so, interrupting yeah yeah no uh, so can i will i have like uh, 5 to 10 minutes more like yeah, uh, sure, for sure, that sure. yeah sure, yeah sure. okay 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 so uh okay so these are the like uh, this uh, antenna aspects as i was talking that this uh, we assume that the antenna elements are some kind of isotropic thing uh, when we talk about the array factor but essentially there are these directive antenna patterns because the simplest antenna that you can realize is a hertzian dipole and the hertzian dipole is not isotropic it is omnidirectional so the figure of eight pattern you have to take into account then the polarization is grossly neglected if you see the mostly the communication literature they are talking about polarization less systems or even if they are considering some kind of polarization that is very like restrictive kind of case and also that is assuming the isotropic like uh, this uh, elements with some kind of polarization so that is a factor then another challenge uh, i will not talk about that uh, here but there is another challenge that we have the antenna elements interacting in the radiating as well as the reactive near fields so when we place the antennas in uh, small distances like inter element spacing might not always be lambda by 2 so we have to consider the near field aspect as well as the user that, that is sitting in front of the base station or some kind of access point they might be interacting in the radiating near field so what happens there 
we no longer can consider that we have the planar like wave fronts like the spatial correlation may not follow the standard Rayleigh or Rishian models that are solely based on the probabilistic angular distribution. So uh, physically speaking, it might say that apart from the theta and phi variation, you have to also consider the radial variation. So these are some kind of challenges. And uh, when we talked in RMC and we had a lot of brainstorming and discussion, so these are the antenna aspects that we thought that must be reconsidered. And then we came into uh, this massive MIMO uplink channeling modeling uh, thing. So there we first started with some of the text groups and saw that how the local scattering spatial correlation model actually operates or how it is basically the theory is provided. So what happens is we have a user element and uh, there could be a number of cluster like scatterers uh, nearby that user element. So it can cause a scattering cluster and these multipath components will come from there. So probably if I told earlier about the angular spread, spread thing, you might not have visualized, but now you can, that uh, the, there is a nominal angle from where the signal is coming, and there is some kind of spread of this. So this is basically the sigma part that we were talking about, the angular incoming, angular spread. And then in the 3D model, it can come from any direction, like it can come from, say, uh, like the planar wave, we can assume. For the time being, we can ignore the spherical wave front, but the planar wave that can come from any theta or any phi, so that nominal angle that can have different values. Now, in the base station, they are generally considering several uniform arrays of this structure. Like of the isotropic elements, they are considering a planar array that could be a single, uh, like cylindrical array, stuff like that. But again, the main thing that I said is the elements are isotropic and they do not have any polarization. If you follow the textbook, that will happen. And that gives a certain uh, like uh, accuracy results. So that is true. It is not wrong or anything like that. But only thing is it has the limited capability that we can impart our antenna knowledge further into this to enhance this uh, kind of uh, local scattering spatial correlation model. So uh, to do that, we first uh, try to understand what the port-to-port -port correlation exactly is. Now I am going slightly deep into this uh, correlation part of thing. So we uh, determine the uh, like correlation in two ways. So it is fundamentally defined for the receive board and it is calculated in the two step. So suppose we have these two antennas placed close together and there is some incoming wave coming and we want to find out the correlation between these two elements. So uh, the step one is consider a equivalent transmit mode of this system. So what we do is we consider we Uh, Professor Devdeep, I think your voice is not not coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's let, let me just check with you.
Yes, Dr. Sharkar, can you listen? Yeah, so am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think there is some issue with the internet connectivity in the campus. Okay. So that thing, thing, thing just. So anyway, I do not have uh, too much to like uh, share at this point. Like uh, I'm almost in the back end of my talk. So yeah. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Just you, yeah, you. You may just go back. I think uh, one or two slides, and uh, that has been missed. Yeah. 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 I think from here itself, I can. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Because. It is. It is not not uh, like too much uh, into that. So yeah. the idea is what I was trying to say is uh, the, the special correlation between these various elements, the various atomic elements. We can be considered in a topic. Now we devise some kind of uh, what should I say? Like some kind of algorithms or some kind of analytical tools. Take into account the pattern also. So I hope you can find and the cross correlation Green's function concept that was introduced by uh, Said and Professor Antar back in 2015. And they, you can follow the book, this new foundation. Special So this cross correlation Green's function thing was uh, basically considering the total antenna current divided into small uh, what should i say small kind of uh, current samples or infinitesimal dipole samples and use the combined effect not helping the pws formula we use some kind of formula based on the current the uh, a couple of words one basic system using this IDM CGF technique and uh, we I also devised an algorithm to find out the analytically is a cross correlation pinch function so the idea is very simple that we uh, now can take into account the various polarizations and various uh, like uh, patterns of this type and particular massive MIMO kind of arrangement and the polarizations could be random also like it is not necessarily these are periodically located kind of elements. We can also have this random polarization. So these things you can look into our paper and you can see that there are uh, several like interesting features that we can do. We do the internal dual MIMO arrays. We can also do the co-located dual polarized massive MIMO arrays, and we can find out the mean azimuth angle variation on the correlation matrix. Okay, and the mean elevation angle. Of that the conventional theory does not, but IDM CJ helps you to perform the entire thing. And one question can come to your mind is okay, what happens if we have simply the like uh, uh, complicated antenna element? You can definitely, if uh, like uh, separate the antenna currents for a complicated instead of vertically polarized IDs. So this kind of things uh, happen and. Finally, once you find out the correlation matrix, then we do the correlation matrix, and there are some ways to find out the Carouen loop representation panel itself. The Carouen loop representation panel to this uh, kind of uh, like a deterministic thing and then uh, we find out the total channel factor. So I will not go into the theoretical part of that. And then uh, there is this uh, idea of approximating the CGF tensor components also. To reduce the load on the numerical computation, we can sometimes go into the analytical evaluation parts as well. So this work was also reported in last year transactions, and it has some heavy involved mathematics. And idea is we wanted to uh, numerical evaluation of the integration part. If you remember, I have told, talked about the integration over 4 pi, something like that. So that integration we no longer have to do because I already found out the solution for that. 
in terms of the distances, in terms of the polarization of the element, we have a closed round form solution. So no longer with the numerical integration, we can go for the analytical solution of the system. So is the approximation the speed by 97% with no loss in accuracy. So this was the kind of drastic improvement that we achieved by using tools. So anyway, I conclude my talk with that. Uh, we, I discussed about the various aspects of the maintenance system in terms of the capacity and and I was uh, kind of antennas and from that part I talk and the design of the time of using thing last part distributed by the next and it you out and then uh, how we can get uh, will like uh, the this mother time I will ask so that are picking us so we to end talk and hope that I will get questions and share my thoughts. Thank Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you listen to me? Hello. Yeah. I'm sorry that actually. Yeah. 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 Did, yeah. Now, yeah. now there was some problem, yeah. internet problem from my end, so I couldn't this one. I'm extremely oh, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, so okay. first of all, uh, let me thank yeah. uh, Professor Devdi for this wonderful talk, and I think that uh, the audience yeah. uh, has really enjoyed it, and we have flooded up with a number of questions. So let me just uh, go by one by one. Okay. So the very first question, what okay, I have okay. received that, what are the applications of UWB MIMO antennas? UWB MIMO antenna, well, uh, that is uh, another field. I hope you can listen to me, like yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. audio is clear and all. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Okay. So the UWB, yeah, UWB MIMO antenna is uh, like uh, amalgamation of the this, uh, what should I say, this uh, short direction, short range kind of radios right by ultra wideband antennas they operate in very low power so these ultra wideband an antennas may not be ha having a large data distances so that is why some people use uh, this uh, mimo concept in that as well so that we uh, enhance the effective data rate so the application of that could be uh, to be specific it could be used in the cognitive radio there are some groups like this uh, professor sharawi and Professor Atif Shamim also, they are uh, collaborating on some of the projects where they use this ultra wideband uh, kind of uh, antennas within like multiple locations to basically the spectrum sensing part, they can do more effectively. That's what they say. Apart from that, it can be used in some other like sensor nodes or things like that. So there are various applications, but I would like to emphasize that the MIMO concept is predominantly used for this uh, like system which have low bandwidth, like uh, for the like cellular communication and this, there is where the application is more, you can see. Uh, the next question yeah. I have found that, what is the advantage of a specially diverse MIMO antenna over orthogonally diverse structures of MIMO antennas? Yeah, so uh, actually the question like should be the other way around. Like mm -hmm. the spatial diversity is the basic thing. Like mm -hmm. you place two antennas in some space apart and uh, then you try to get some kind of diversity out of that. It could be through the pattern. It could be slightly due to the tilting of the polarization as well. But the thing is, if you have uh, this 
orthogonal polarization that is definitely more advantageous and this diversity has been used in base station antenna systems for a long time now people are trying to use it in the handset kind of configuration okay so uh, the advantage is the polarization diversity generally gives you the better or the lesser value of the envelope correlation coefficient than simple spatial diversity but nevertheless eventually what is happening is if you are placing two antennas far apart then they will definitely have very less uh, correlation or very less uh, you should say coupling so that can give but we are not always having that luxury right to keep the antennas in a specially far location so that is why in nearby antenna elements people use this polarization diversity okay Uh, the next yeah. question is uh, we can we can measure ecc from s parameter and far field results but the two results have mm -hmm. individual variations or small disagreements with each other can you please comment on this yeah yes 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 so what happens is when you find out from the s parameters as i mentioned i think also probably mm -hmm. at that time the uh, link was not off so mm -hmm. i think that part was covered hopefully mm -hmm. so uh, the thing is the s parameter based formula basically covers a uh, uniform propagation environment scenario and uh, then uh, for the, the non uniform scenario the results will not match like if you compute for the non uniform scenario it will not match but if even if for the uniform propagation scenario there are some of the parameters that we basically miss that one is basically the what should i say like uh, the efficiency of the individual elements so that is sometimes not taken into account in the s parameter formula and the second thing is uh, sometimes uh, the s parameters are itself like the computation can be little bit of problematic in the full web solver itself so the far fields or uh, like s parameters might be computed properly but the far field values that are obtained from the uh, solver sometimes it is not the exact far field because that depends on the boundary conditions that you take for the boundary box and sometimes there is some issue with the way they calculate the far far zone radiated field so there are some kind of, some discrepancies may definitely come uh, into that but i hope in practical scenario that will not be too much like that yeah. discrepancy yeah if you take into account the efficiency and if you take into account the properly calculated far zone fields sometimes people what uh, like i also did that many of my uh, like friends and students also do like they keep the boundary box very close to the antenna system so the far field is not accurately calculated so that is there is an issue for that yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, the ne the next question is uh, what is the role of mimo in biomedical field Means and he, in the continuation of the same, he is asking that how we can mm. use it in medical field because in biomedical field antennas are required very compact in size and mimos are large in size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, well, I should like to be in the biomedical field. I am not sure that it is very smart to put a large number yeah. of antennas yeah. inside. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but the thing is, what I can say that uh, sometimes the uh, far field monitoring is also required for some kind mm -hmm. of application like you can put an array of antennas in basically mimo is nothing but a complete con like combination of multiple antennas and you do some kind of signal processing from the like uh, different antenna signals so what you can do some kind of radar kind of application mimo radars are they useful and some of the mimo radar application can also spill over to the this far field monitoring and um, uh, like uh, what should i say like imaging kind of application but not exactly like i don't think it's a like good idea to put lot of antennas on the body yeah. maybe one or two like diversity antennas can can be used yeah yeah the next question i think already you have taken across that is what is icc and uh, ecc and how do we uh, or why do we need it in my i think you already had discussed it so i am skipping it the next question is uh, yeah, yeah. what is the phase given to four elements array is it variable to vary pattern i uh, yeah, like uh, well the structure that i showed as i remember like it is basically the patterns that i showed are for the individual elements like uh, with all the other elements uh, given in the mass flow termination so there is scope of doing anything you can like from the simulator and also from the experiment you can give the variable phase and you can see how the pattern is uh, behaving and in the reverse way also like uh, if you are having a user talking from a certain angle you can judge it and then give the phase and the amplitude accordingly so this is what sometimes happens yeah yeah 
uh, the next question i would say that uh, that what is uh, I, i don't know what is the meaning also what is the effect of rain if massive mimo is deployed in millimeter wave range what is the effect of rain rain or rain, uh, rain. Yeah. Oh, rain oh okay 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 yeah so uh, basically uh, what like this a good question uh, millimeter wave frequency we are uh, talking about certain kits required uh, rain absorption and all those things are less uh, effective because those windows we can only work because when the and another important thing is this massive mimo is generally long not for the like large coverage like uh, for the coverage tire you are going to have this uh, uh, probably this uh, sub 6 gigahertz antennas and sub 1 gigahertz antennas for the coverage thing the for the small uh, cell applications then we think about the massive mimo so millimeter wave massive mimo the cell uh, dimension is not very large so that it will be affected by the atmospheric conditions too much yeah, yeah. the next question is what is the most suitable channel model for massive mimo and also the replacement of the conventional cell cellular model in 5g yeah so uh, like that there are you can study there are a lot of references on it basically what i found was there are this uh, like two uh, two dimensional gaussian beam that is uh, uh, is uh, like basically used that is along the azimuth also there is the Ga gaussian distribution around the uh, elevation also there is this gaussian so they are actually we can uh, have this kind of uh, mm, uh, that is a very popular model you can say two dimensional gaussian but there are some other models and mostly uh, many people are also working on finding out the proper channel model for various scenarios because we can move into lot of uncharted territories also so people are looking into building more effective models for massive uh, mining okay the next question is can we design separate ground plane for different antenna elements in mino <laughs> yeah i think uh, well in different <laughs> conferences i talked about this with lot of my uh, colleagues and friends and there so there are some people who say that it has to be on the same ground plane but i think that thing is taken sometimes too far like uh, uh, when we design the mimo antenna for the say a handset mobile handset then definitely we cannot break the ground plane we have to somehow put the antenna elements on the thing but suppose we are designing the mimo antenna for a wireless access point then it is not uh, no hard and fast rule is there that it has to be on the same ground plane or something like that so it depends on the application and it is not that the mimo consequent mimo signal processing is greatly affected if the ground planes are separate but yeah for some applications you definitely have to keep the ground plane uh, like connected as i mentioned regarding the mobile handset and the things but for the other things uh, you might like as well work without that but yeah i agree that there are many people and many senior groups that uh, keep on saying that you have to keep the ground plane connected always yeah but so it depends on the application in my opinion yeah, yeah. the next question is what is the difference between mimo antenna and antenna array in context of application yeah so i think uh, i addressed this part uh, in the initial part of my presentation that uh, yeah. basically we have multiple antenna both are multiple antenna systems in one case we can have a array factor and we can find out the total radiation pattern by using the array factor and element pattern in the mimo it might it is not the case it is you can say a generalized thing or you can say the array is kind of a subset of this multiple antenna uh, system so in terms of application the phased array and all those things they are like working for ages and there are several application in the space and the radar and i i might not need to emphasize on that because that is uh, like for a long time people are doing this mimo is a like a subset that is used in the cellular communication or some near field communication also people are envisioning where they are trying to extract the signals for these multiple ports and they are trying to do some signal processing to enhance the like in uh, enhance the capacity so uh, like from application point of view you can say that mimo is more closely related to this 5g and the upcoming thing like there is some kind of new technology also for the 6g which i did not cover here so there something between a mix between the mimo and some uh, like uh, intelligent reflecting surface all those kind of things will come so uh, there are many things that are coming so effectively everything is related to the reflect array and the phase array so basic concept you can come uh, bring from there but you can extend it to some different application based on the requirement
Then the next yeah. question next question is how to calculate the channel matrix analytically and channel capacity with respect to frequency. Yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, channel matrix analytically, I think I went on that part too fast. But uh, the, yeah. the interested person can like uh, contact me also or like drop me an email and yeah, we can share some of the uh, things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think just one line I will say that the idea is to find out the correlation matrix analytically and then use some uh, uh, models like this Caro and Loop model is one of them. There are some yeah. other models available and you can just combine that. So the yeah. essence is correlation matrix calculation. Yeah. yeah. The next question I think already you have discussed earlier that what is the role of 4G in 5G? Will it evolve or will it mm -hmm. be a complete new radio access technology? So I am not taking it. I think you already have done it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, the next yeah. question is, uh, is it possible to calculate different MIMO parameters like ECC, PARC, etc. directly in HFSS? Yeah, I think uh, like basically there are uh, like, uh, I uh, will to share you that I used to like generally extract those things and do the calculation in MATLAB. But yeah. many of my like uh, master students and junior colleagues were smarter and they put the <laughs> macro in the HFSS itself. So it is definitely doable. Like once you know the formula, you can put in the HFSS in an intelligent way and get the entire mm. thing out of there. So it's not a big deal. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it is better to get that thing and see the data in a proper way, raw data mm. and process it in MATLAB. It gives us a feel. So mm. you can uh, do that. Yeah. yeah. The next question also again, I think you have discussed how to incorporate the concepts of channel modeling to the MIMO antenna system in simulation. I think already yeah. you have you have told. So I'm not yeah, yeah, yeah. I think last question is yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Beamforming whether it will be analog, digital, or hybrid in five G. Ah, yeah. I think this is a very good question, and yeah. uh, like uh, like there is a uh, several like uh, research that is going in this direction. So initially, people are talking about the like a simple digital beam forming, but that might not be always the case. People can also have to go for the hybrid beam form. So mm -hmm. it is the exact answer is not really readily available with us because some mm -hmm. groups are uh, like suppose I have 16 antenna elements, just for exa example. So I can feed all the 16 ports independently, but I can also have say four uh, ports and then tune variable phases and then give the digital beam forming on the four ports and some kind of analog phase shifting and applying in the later stages. So this kind of hybrid beam forming can also be there. So uh, people mostly are looking into going for the digital beam forming, but some uh, problems like uh, practical realization problems might hinder and we can have to go for the hybrid beam forming. But definitely if we have digital beam forming, that will be the probably the best solution. But uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, is there any role of cognitive radio in 5G? Yeah, definitely. I think yeah. it falls in one of the umbrellas and yes. uh, it mostly falls into the yes, massive uh, internet of things and all those domains. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. The next question is, how is the power controlled to take, take care of the radiation hazards on human beings? Yes, yes, yes. This is an excellent question. and. This is a concern, like people all the time they have when we talk about increasing the antenna gain. But uh, you should know that antenna gain and the amplifier gain are not the same. So mm. basically, by when we increase the antenna gain, we are saying that we are basically redirecting the power in a specific uh, way and we are enhancing the link efficiency. So the power, the way in MIMO it works is that it is basically tailor-made to work in lower SNR levels. Like uh, when we have the multiple antennas properly sorted out, we can have the same kind of uh, channel capacity performance or bit rate performance with lesser amount of power. So that is the and sometimes in some of the certain situation, it, people say that if uh, power level basically comes down as one upon the square root of the number of transmit antenna elements. So inherently, when we go for the MIMO, we bring down the power, we can bring down the power level to certain. So uh, the radiation hazard thing is not really an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, the next one, yeah. So the, uh, the next one is a repetition of questions. And the next question is, what about the multipath effect in MIMO channel? Yeah, m like, uh, well, this uh, MIMO channel is uh, definitely, uh, this is a like fundamental question that the guy asked. So 
basically we are going to have uh, uh, we are basically using the multipath if i'm like trying to frame the sentence properly we are basically using the multipath in a intelligent way so that we can enhance our uh, like channel capacity platform mm -hmm. so without multipath if suppose i am just simply working in a line of sight kind of thing then well uh, might be that there is only one strong dominant path and uh, the other paths are very much less dominant so there will be effectively no increase in the like channel capacity in in mathematical terms that amounts to that we have a 4 by 4 matrix but the rank is one so effectively there is no increase in the channel capacity once we have the multipath once we have all these uh, scattered thing then we can possibly use the four times enhancement the rank of the 4 by 4 matrix becomes four and then you can enhance so multipath is definitely the essence like in this single user mimo system to increase the capacity okay so the next question uh, what i have found that if we, if we try to use ai control on the handling of the massive mimo what are your views mm -hmm. on this yeah this is uh, like uh, definitely something people are looking into and <laughs> thanks for the question it is an idea <laughs> that we can uh, do uh, we can uh, carry out some project or some research on direction because yeah. in a real life scenario it might be that some ai controlled or some previously trained neural network can uh, do wonders in terms of the reducing the inter user interference or enhancing the capacity so yeah definitely that is a, uh, yeah. a, a like interesting problem yeah, yeah. okay so and the next question is, uh, I think this is also you have covered that what is the basic difference between MIMO and Massive MIMO. So this this I am not taking. And uh, the next question is that uh, that the, the, I think yeah the, what is what is the uh, can you suggest any book to understand the uh, the basics of MIMO? Uh, well, I think uh, this is a good question because. Uh, I faced really a lot of challenge while uh, doing yeah. research in this direction because uh, for, for the communication point of view, you have several good books like uh, mm -hmm. uh, many good college and uh, all, all those then some book by uh, Professor Chokalingam and uh, the large mimos. But if from the uh, an antenna point of view, uh, there is a book by Professor Sharavi, but I think uh, uh, there is a dearth of books also uh, like to understand the MIMO from the antenna perspective. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe like in future something will come up and we can have this uh, thing. But yeah. for the time being, it is better to follow the lectures and e Emil Bjornsson, yeah, he has a very good lecture series available in the YouTube. So that mm -hmm. is one resource that people can use. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the next question I think that is out of this topic, that is how do RFID work? So I am not taking that okay. question okay, over okay. here. Okay, so yeah. uh, I, I think that, yeah, so we have uh, taken all the questions, whatever has been solved okay. over here. And uh, okay. so let me thank once again to the speaker. And uh, let me also first uh, tell to all the participants that I have shared the feedback link over here multiple times. I am sh sharing it once again. So please fill it up that uh, before you are leaving for this meeting. So I just request all of you to kindly fill the feedback form. So I think that, yeah, so we are at the back end of this particular meeting. So may I just request Shogato for any kind of concluding remarks? Sorry, yeah. uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Shoma Bhattacharya, thank you. And uh, Professor Devdeep Sharkar, thank you so much. It's a wonderful talk and very exciting. And I think thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, those who are joined. They can learn uh, actually uh, what is MIMO and what is the application, how can we use it, what is Super MIMO and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for your, giving your. Well, I, 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 I should apologize a little bit that in the middle some some problem was there no, from that, my that, side. That, 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 is, that, is not, that is not your apology. That is not controlled on your hand. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, you yeah, so yeah, much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank yeah. May I also request Shopnil for any kind of concluding comments here? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving that excellent talk. And I hope that it will be helpful for most of the participants to carry out their research in this direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and before Thank before you. winding up, I, I, I am seeing uh, Professor V. Mohadevan among the audience leads. So, Mohadevan, sir, can you unmute yourself and keep your video on and please say some words? Oh, th thank you for the opportunity. It was an excellent lecture on uh, the MIMO. Thank you, sir. And this is the hot topic which every researchers, specifically in the RF field, are looking for. And uh,
to go about the various areas specifically today you introduced this one on the correlation aspect and the spatial diversity and others which they can look for so apart from the antennas they can also go to the channel modeling side and then get into that so that is another area which uh, all uh, research can researchers can get into it so the talk was uh, from very basic up to the point which you came it was very very clear and then uh, it, it would have really benefited the students like anything that's what we was expected so yeah. thank you so much for giving thank me. you sir thank, thank you thank you thank, thank you, you for the comment so we thank you. welcome yeah. dr deep sarkar yeah. to iasc bangalore so i was of course yeah, uh, ex student of iasc thank you thank you, of thank you sir. Yeah. yeah so to all the very best in iasc oh <laughs> okay that's that's a big thing okay 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 so i definitely would like to meet you sir sometime yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we'll meet yeah 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 thank you thank definitely. you sir. thank you so so i think that yeah we have taken all the all the questions and let's thank once again our speaker dr sarkar once again for this wonderful talk and let me also also talk uh, also thank the all the participants who have presented over here amidst this pandemic situation and that yes that uh, we this particular webinar has been recorded and yes we will share the recording very soon with all of you and thanks uh, to all of you for joining it over here and please have a stay safe thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you